don't know where you should <laughs> stand. Great. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. Um, yeah, Tim and I are really excited to be here. Um, we are looking forward to learning all things sort of UX over the next couple of days. Um, our talk is called Crafting an Innovative and Holistic Art Style for User Interfaces. Quite a lot of words in that one. Um, and we're essentially going to be looking at the sort of visual style uh, around designing user interfaces. So, quick introduction as to, as to who we are. We're from the PlayStation Studios creative team. Um, we're an internal agency based within PlayStation Studios, and our whole remit is uh, you know, de design skills for the games industry. Um, Tim and I are from the UI UX team. Because we're an internal agency, we only work with uh, studios from PlayStation Studios, and, uh, which unfortunately means we can't work with everyone. Uh, Tim and I are from the UI UX team, uh, and we're based in London. We actually make up 50% of the UI UX team, so we're, we're quite small. Uh, yeah, we also work with the brand team, the motion graphics team within our group, and we, we also work with freelancers. The group, we've been doing UI UX work for uh, over 10 years, and we've worked on uh, a myriad of different titles. We've probably worked on about 20 different titles. Um, and working with a lot of different teams means that we really have to flex our, um, our visual style and the different approaches that we apply to each project. But also, you know, when we're working with different teams, that requires different and, and innovative ways of working. Now, um, we, because we're an agency, we work in that sort of client agency uh, setup. So I'm going to be referring to our clients as, as clients, but that could equally well apply to uh, art directors, uh, game directors, that sort of thing, if, if that's how it is set up in your team. So to give you a little bit of an overview as to how we think about UI, our, our sort of game UI philosophy, um, we envisage game UI as the sort of intersection between... Um, Film UI, where there's a real focus on narrative and visual design, and uh, app and web UI, where the main focus is usability. Now, this conference predominantly focuses on the left-hand side of usability, you know, using the scientific method to make educated, um, educated decisions about the, the user experience. Um, but, you know... Uh, as Don Norman says, you know, attractive things work better. And so I think if we neglect that uh, right-hand side, uh, the, the visual side of the design, um, we're not sort of potentially giving as rich an experience as we, as we perhaps could. So what we really geek out about, what we're really passionate about, is when, uh, when a UI design incorporates uh, good, strong visuals, excellent usability, and incorporates the narrative. So it, it brings in some of those game world elements. To give you a couple of examples of this from games that we didn't work on, um, here is uh, uh, Ghost of Tsushima on the left. So if we think about the problem uh, of uh, pathfinding in games, how, do, how, you get, how you tell the player to go where they need to go, um, you could do a mini-map, you could have an icon on the horizon, you could have a compass, but none of those options would really be suitable for, for either of these two games. So why not use the wind, like in Ghost of Tsushima, to lead the player in the rough direction where they need to go? Or if you need to be more specific, perhaps we could uh, have, your, have you hold up your sword, shine a light off of that in the direction of the next colossus. So neither of these um, solutions are the most efficient way of doing this, but I think by incorporating the narrative, uh, we potentially could create a, a richer experience that feels in keeping with the game. Cool. So let's begin our journey. And our quest today is to have a look at our process from when we first receive a brief all the way to a visually striking interface. Uh, we'll then wrap things up um, with our kind of learnings from working on Returnal. The process can be broken down to three main components. We've got the um, brief, the idea, and the execution. Let's take a quick look at the brief. This is a really important step, and we can kind of relate to it similar to a game tutorial. You might already know the basics, and you might already know the system, so it's kind of like tempting to skip. 
But um, if you kind of spend more, the more time you spend with it, the more it's going to pay off in the future. And these are like the main purposes of the brief that you want to take away. Again, these might sound obvious, but again, we feel like these are key steps. So you really want to learn about the world, kind of like immerse yourself in the, the universe, the law, the narrative, and beyond that, kind of play, watch, read as much as you can in that genre. Uh, get answers and constraints. You want to kind of ask so many questions that you come off as a little bit annoying. Um, you want to know what the game is, and equally as important, what it isn't. If it's like a first-person shooter, what, how, how is it kind of like different from others out there? And you know, just as we never assume what our users are thinking, we should never assume what our client um, art directors or kind of like other directors are thinking. Really dig, dig deep and kind of understand the parameters that you're working in. Sorry, <laughs> build rapport and trust. So, um, you know, as, as you're kind of like asking these questions, and hopefully they're the right questions, um, there'll become a point where you sync with your director in the case where you're like sharing their vision. And this kind of also means like the um, pitching idea should be a lot easier. Once you've established a good relationship, you'll probably have more luck pushing creative and progressive ideas, and the collaboration should become more efficient. Cool, so tutorial mode over. Um, we now have uh, the, the sort of brief and we know where we're going with our visual design. The next step um, that we're, that we're going to be looking at is the idea. What we're looking for is a really great sort of awesome idea to rule them all. Um, like a really strong visual concept that we can keep referring to throughout the process uh, that will unlock new and innovative creative ideas. To, to give you an example of one of the projects we worked on in this regard, uh, we'll turn to Dreams that we worked on with Media Molecule. Um, for those of you not familiar with Dreams, it's essentially a tool to create games, movies, music, and a whole myriad of other things. When Media Molecule asked us to get involved, they had all of these disparate parts of, of UI, and they, they wanted this kind of unifying wrapper to bring everything together. Um, so... We pitched a bunch of ideas, but the idea that really stuck in the end was this concept of light, and specifically using Bokeh lens effects. Um, why did we choose light? Well, the whole process in Dreams is about creation and creativity, and before you create anything, you need, you need a, a sort of spark of inspiration or a light bulb moment, and we literally took that idea from there and ran with it. So... Instead of sort of jumping straight into Google Images or Pinterest, um, as we normally do, we, we locked ourselves in a dark room with some cameras and some lights, and we really tried to understand you know, how, how light works and, and how it behaves and understand the limitations of that. We discovered that if we put a filter in front of the camera, we can actually change the shape of the bokeh. So we got all of these really amazing uh, visuals that we were able to build from. But we also got to see all of the imperfections, and by sort of bringing those imperfections into the later screens that I'll show you, hopefully we created something original and authentic. So this was the first test that we did before we, we kind of shared this idea with Media Molecule. We really wanted to uh, sort of stress test it, and well, can, can we make a UI from this? Does it work? And, and this kind of proved, proved the point that, that we could. We then took that and involved that even more to a uh, sort of a, a very early flow. And so, so you can see with all of the experimentation stuff that we did, we were able to get the light leaks, the, the kind of layering on the type, um, the sort of general floatiness of everything. And um, yeah, we, we were just really proud with that, uh, with that solution because it, it just it didn't really look like anything else. Um, so it had this sort of lovely innovative approach to it. So as, as we can see, like, we've got this core idea of light, um, and then we're, we're coming back to that at every point, and, and by doing that, we create the opportunity to come up with some really interesting, innovative solutions. So where do these ideas come from? And you're probably familiar with kind of like a lot of these methods, but it's, again, good to recap each one. So mind mapping kind of really helps you explore and expand on what your idea could be. Referencing, as kind of Ian has mentioned, we like to stay away from like Pinterest and Google and re-explore other kind of forms and methods such as photography, uh, architecture or fashion. And kind of like the more experiences you tend to have, the more you can lean on when you're coming up with your idea. 
collaboration, as they say, you know, two brains are better than one, and it's really good to sound ideas off other people. Uh, lastly, experimentations, you know, just as we did on Dreams, we went a little crazy and a little bit loose, and, you know, we came up with a good idea from that. Um, there'll be, you know, and after, you know, researching for a good period of time, you're going to have loads of really cool, awesome ideas. And this is kind of like the attitude you want to have because it's scientifically proven that, you know, happiness and comfort uh, are key attributes to successful creative thinking. But some ideas are more awesomer than others. Um, <laughs> I don't know who wrote this. Um, you know, uh, and like there'll become a point where like you'll need to you cut ideas because they're probably a little bit too abstract or they don't align to the brief or probably, yeah, just a little bit too complicated. And the goal here is to get uh, essentially from uh, three to five routes. Um, the, the, the sweet spot for us tends to be free. Clients may vary for us. Um, some like to play it safe. Others like to play it risky. For us to, to navigate this, we kind of like to to present a range of options that go from safe to risky. And it's usually the one in the middle, which is the sweet spot, kind of like innovative, but not too abstract. So um, let's take a look at how we um, use this. And we're going to take a look at Destruction All Stars, a title that we worked on with Lucid Games. For those who don't know, uh, Destruction All Stars is a game where you kind of just create as much mayhem and havoc as possible in your cars. Um, and what we're looking at here is the kind of like um, the final key art, but as you can, as we'll go through, this could have gone in a few different directions. So um, very early on in the pitch process, uh, we collaborated uh, really closely with our brand team, and this kind of meant the design went beyond just the UI. Um, here we've got, yeah, again, five very early kind of uh, designs um, for the, what was known back then as uh, Project Mayhem. They kind of each represent a different idea and a possible visual execution for each of these ideas. You can kind of see they're quite loose and you know, cobbled together. But again, the idea is just to really help the client visualize. As part of this unified pitch as well, we um, created UI concepts. And we thought a lot about kind of like color, typography, uh, character poses, tone, and feel. And this is still a really important step, even if you're not collaborating with the um, brand, because you and the client just want to sync on an idea. Um, we've probably all experienced this before, where teams want to say, oh, we like this idea, and this idea, and this idea, and we kind of want to merge it all together. This is kind of completely fine to do, as long as your main idea or concept doesn't get too diluted. So um, in this case, the client really liked the third route of collision. Um, it had a really cool kind of angular shape vibe to it um, and kind of debris breaking out. Uh, but as you'll see, this, this design still had a long way to go. So uh, in the example of Destruction All Stars, we have our concept collision, and we're now going to sort of move on to the execution phase. Uh, the execution phase is really sort of chipping away, whittling down that idea into something uh, that's a fully fledged design system. We want to be asking the questions, you know, what, what are the design rules? What's the final visual style? How does it move? What are the constraints? Um, so again, if we, we take that idea of collision, um, one of the, the first things that we did uh, during this execution phase was looking at how we could apply that collision to uh, a myriad of different, uh, different things, like where we could put that uh, concept. So starting from the top right, what if we had the collision idea and we put that actually in the arena? Or maybe we, we started you know, playing around with billboards and printed ephemera, so it's still in the arena, but different execution. One on the left here, uh, abstract, you know, abstract chunks of debris floating around with the UI on that. And then this final one uh, on the bottom left is very much uh, broadcast graphics, so we wanted to create that sort of live TV feel with that. Um, the client really loved the TV concept and the abstract concept, so we kind of smushed them together a little bit um, while still uh, playing true to the, to the collision idea. And this is the, the sort of concept that we, we came up with. Uh, it's sort of a very live, uh, lower third concept. It takes all of the sort of chunks of debris, there's energy, there's sort of fractured type. Um, so it just really captured the, the mood and, and, the, and the feeling of, of the product. 
and we, and we kept pushing this in, in different directions as well, and, and we had the idea of where, where it made sense we would have the, uh, the sort of live video footage behind the UI. So again, sort of capturing that, that TV vibe. After a bunch of iteration, this was our first hero shot that we ended up with. And, and you can see here it's changed quite a lot from, from the previous design. We, we dropped the 3D elements in, in favor of more 2D. But the, the sort of debris shapes and chunks were, were still very much evident there. And once you have one hero shot, what you want to do is you want to you know, look at developing four to six different shots. And this will give you a really good range of the visual style, understand which components you can use, uh, which ones can, can work across multiple screens. Um, and then from that stage, you might want to go ahead and create a style guide, which really refines what the visual style is. You might want to go and do the other 5, 10, 300 screens that the game requires. Um, and, you know, as we did in Destruction All-Stars, we did uh, a motion mock-up. So motion is really great, um, and, you know, it really helps all of the static design come to, live and, and, uh, come to life. And you can see here that this collision idea is very much uh, used in the motion as well. So whenever we're sort of transitioning those screens, we're sort of adding camera shape. There's this floating debris and, and uh, like, high amounts of energy. In my opinion, uh, motion's criminally underused in the, game, uh, in the game UI world, and it falls into two camps. It's either really, really basic, or everything's happening at once, and you can't tell what's going on. But I think used well, it can really help the players uh, you know, transition from, from one page to another in, in a really lovely way, and really aids the, the UX experience. So that was a sort of very quick overview of how we go from very early brief to, to Fully, fully finished design, although no designs are ever <laughs> really finished, right? Um, we're now going to take a look at one of our more recent titles, Returnal. So here we are um, at the boss level, and we refer to it as the boss level because it's probably our most ambitious project to date. Uh, for those unfamiliar with Returnal, it's a third-person action horror shooter in where the uh, main protagonist, Selene, tries to escape from a time loop on an alien planet. Uh, again, we had a really uh, fantastic and harmonious relationship with Housemark on this project for just over two years, helping define the visual style, uh, motion, and supporting on implementation. So using our processes from before, we'll take a look at how we developed the visuals. Um, from a very early kind of stage, from receiving kind of like draft scripts and concept art, we devised four kind of like distinctive routes. Uh, in the top left, we've got alien hardware, top right, uh, functional lo-fi, bottom left, arcade, and our risky route uh, in the bottom right is cosmic runes. Um, in this case, though, the, the, the client really liked the top right route, uh, functional lo-fi, because it fit the brief that we received. So um, let's take a look at how we kind of like broke this down. Um, so we broke this down and kind of like tried to look at what functional lo-fi meant. Um, and we broke that down into kind of like three additional routes, which was industrial, retro detail, and clean modern. Uh, to help kind of like illustrate this as well, we mapped um, out these routes on a kind of like a grid axis on the kind of like horizontal route. We've got the level tech uh, which we were representing. And on the vertical axis, we've got the level detail. Um, Housemark did an approach, and we can kind of see it on the bottom right there, and it leans much more towards like, high tech um, and high detail. So we knew already where the spaces are that we could work in. Um, and for us, we find the grid to be a really, can be a really strong tool because it allows for two things. It really, again, really helps distinguish the, like, where the design sits. And like, the client can physically point to an area where they might want to move a design. So um, from that, um, we kind of like created a whole bunch of uh, varied executions. Um, and this helps for one key reason, and that's basically we don't want the kind of client to imagine an idea. We want to kind of show it to them and so they can kind of like digest everything. So um, from here, uh, the, again, the client really liked the uh, industrial route, and that kind of settled down to this kind of like idea, which kind of uh, was the base for our uh, full idea. Um, and as the game progressed more and more, the 
idea of functional industrial kind of just made so much more sense. The concept is really tied with Celine's um, vulnerability and isolation, something the developers were, again, really keen to push. Celine isn't like Space Rambo. She's like a kind of like an explorer. And the company she works for, Astrocorp, probably has thousands of other um, explorers combing the galaxy. So we wanted the hardware and software to feel kind of like cheap and kind of like expendable, cutting costs where they could. And to like emphasize this quality or you know, lack thereof, um, we decided to pass the UI through a CRT monitor, similar to the techniques they used on um, Alien Isolation, which is kind of like one of our all time favorite uh, UIs. On top of this, we kind of like added glitches, scan lines, uh, dirt and scratches. And what this evoked was this really cool, awesome, wicked, you know, 70s, 80s sci fi horror genre uh, kind of like, uh, feel, similar to like a 2001 Space Odyssey. What this kind of like implies as well is kind of like a sense of nostalgia and it evokes, and so that means kind of like the, the player can connect emotionally on that level as well. What we didn't anticipate though was how hard it was to kind of like um, get the, the visuals for 3D models. Um, on the left, we can see a house marks approach. Again, this was really awesome, but it was probably too high tech for what we needed. So we lent into like this wireframe approach. Um, and we can, you can see in the middle there, we kind of applied it to the weapon and the item model. Looks really cool there, but on Celine's avatar on the right, it just didn't feel right. It kind of just uh, didn't have the right detail we needed as well. So after a period of time, um, we came up with this idea. And it's kind of like a dot matrix printer that's run out of ink. But again, it aligns to the brief and our core idea. It gives a cool retro data appearance, again, pushing that cheap expendable fill. And as the um, kind of like UI developed more and more, we had to set rules. Um, and the rules were kind of like, we just wanted to uh, kind of diminish the amount of details, kind of like the layers. Again, we didn't want to imply a higher level of tech. This also came across to our motion design as well. We wanted stuff to feel kind of like flickery on and off. And we didn't want to use kind of like pulses or anything that had long tweens or transitions. So no project's complete without a few challenges. Uh, and there are a couple that we, we wanted to share today uh, from working on Returnal. Um, the first one was the idea of the, the tutorial prompts that, that came up. And we, we have this, this kind of uh, visual style, uh, which is for Celine's suit and, and for the screens in the ship, which is developed by the company Astracorp. And this is very much the sort of narrative visual aesthetic. Um, so it, it, it made sense for us to put the tutorial style within that so it would fit harmoniously with the HUD. However, it fit a little bit too harmoniously because in user testing, uh, a lot of players were missing this. Um, so we, we actually had two different types of uh, visual style for Returnal's UI. We had a, what we termed the meta UI, and we used this for settings. And the distinction we drew between this was that the meta style was used for any messaging that we would talk directly to the player, whereas the AstraCorp kind of suit UI uh, that was used for the HUD was when we were talking to Celine, um, sorry, talking to the player via Celine. So it, it fit more in with that narrative. So it made a lot more sense to use the meta styling for the tutorials, given that we were talking directly to the player. And it's, it's quite a subtle difference, but um, it helped us to sort of, with, with, our, with our thinking as to what style we should use and where. Something else that we really spent a lot of time with is the, uh, the threat indicator. So where enemy attacks were coming from and letting Celine or the player know just uh, before they were about to strike so you could effectively dodge. Um, we, we tried a bunch of ideas with that, like we, we tried um, sort of suit-based uh, UI, like in Dead Space, we, we tried sort of audio waves. We really wanted to bring in the, the narrative component so that Celine would, would kind of see the threat indicator and it, it would feel part of that world. Um, we came up with this around the time we were playing with wireframes, we came up with this really cool aesthetic that we really liked, the client really liked, and it looked really cool. Um, but if anyone's played Returnal, uh, these moments of, of bullet hell, something like that just wasn't going to work at all. So reluctantly, we, we kind of went for something a lot more simple. Um, so I guess the point with this is sometimes, you know, it's always worthwhile to try and incorporate that narrative component into any UI decisions that you make. 
uh, but when it doesn't work and it compromises usability, you have to, you have to put usability first. To give you some examples of when we were successfully able to incorporate uh, some of the narrative into the, into the UI, um, I, I spoke a little bit before about AstraCorp or Astra Corporation, and, th and this was something that came across in, in the scripts when we were reading that. Uh, it was mentioned a lot um, during the game, and it just didn't have much of a presence in the game. So given that AstraCorp was the company that built the ship and Celine's suit, we wanted to give it more of a, uh, of a presence. So working with the brand team, we uh, create some logos uh, and use those around the game. And we also developed like a, a sort of low-tech uh, boot-up screen with, with the motion graphics department, um, which just helped keep everything sort of real and feeling like a, a real world. And that was used on the ship screens and also the wrist computer. And when we're talking about the wrist computer, um, if we look back at the screens that, that Tim was talking about previously, this is actually a screen from the wrist computer. However, that wasn't really made an obvious connection between, uh, between the two. So if this was a first-person game, you could do like a nice little animation with that, but you can't really do that in a third-person game without having some pretty crazy camera angles. So um, we, we sought to try and bring some of the wrist computer components into the UI. This was our first attempt. Um, we did a sort of very, very quick mock-up in Photoshop. It, it was fine. It sort of got that idea across, but the quality level just wasn't there. So we then did another example uh, where we actually created the, the frame in 3D. We added some beveling. We added some real-world lighting. We added a bit of a warp on the screen. So hopefully it, it kind of eased that transition between the two. But then we had a problem that, uh, you know, Returnal is set in some pretty diverse biomes. So one sort of solution for all of that wouldn't, wouldn't really work because of the different color palettes. So we, we took that as an opportunity to, to think about how can we take each biome and bring that more into the UI. And this was one of the examples that, that we did for one of the more rainy uh, biomes. Like we, we brought reflections in, we brought, uh, but more importantly, we brought this sort of environmental elements in, so the, the rain and, and everything. Um, we maybe went a bit too far on this one uh, and sort of ex obscured the UI a little bit, but um, I think it's always important to push those ideas as far as you can so that you can come back from them. Um, so this was, this was what we ended up with. Uh, we, we created six different frames for each biome. Um, this was the sort of first, first example. Then when you progress on to the Crimson Desert, we sort of do a, a big color tint. We're also bringing in dust, different, um, different reflections based on the, on the sky maps from, from the biomes. And then we pushed it even further with the Citadel biome, which was uh, sort of an icy, snow-based um, environment. And so we've got a little bit of frost there sort of eating in at the screen. Um, and, you know, the, the, the main purpose of this was to avoid the jarring effect between when you are, uh, you're playing the game and then you hop into the UI, but it was also an, a nice little bonus for when you unlock a new biome, you also get a new sort of UI skin as well. And to draw a distinction between the wrist computer and the ship computer, we did another frame for, for the ship computer as well, which was different, and um, I included this slide because the Japanese versions always look really cool. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about bringing the world into the UI. Um, one of the things that we really tried to do on Returnal was, was take the UI and bring that back into the world. Too often on games we see the, the UI that the player is interacting with narratively uh, is different in design to all of the screens and things that you see around in the environment. And it, it makes sense, right, because it's different teams, but we, we worked really hard to collaborate with the teams that did the cinematics and the environment team to make sure that this AstroCorp aesthetic was kind of pushed across all of the, the different screens. So we can see here on the ship the screens that you interact with, the cinematics and the, the wrist computer cinematics as well. So we're pushing our, um, our key visual, the AstroCorp uh, UI, out into the world. And, you know, that, that was great, but we actually, for Returnal, we pushed it even further. We collaborated with the brand team and the video team, who are responsible for a lot of the marketing videos, uh, to, to be able to bring our, our UI style into sort of all areas of, of the, the product. And that's really the sort of ultimate goal with a lot of these things. It is, you know, from the first point that your consumer or your player sees the product advertised through to, to the back, to the branding, through to the marketing, 
uh, and the social media campaigns. And then at the last point, when the, the player finally boots up the game and, and they see the UI, there's this kind of consistent message all the way through. So you have this holistic concept, which works really well for Returnal. Cool. So let's summarize. Um, the idea is key. You want a really strong idea at the core of your design's work, something you can springboard uh, new approaches and innovative solutions. Be flexible, but set boundaries and don't let the concept get too watered down. Be a little bit crafty. You know, get the pens and papers out. Explore with um, other media, that, just as we do on Dreams. It's, uh, like, it's super refreshing just to get away from the digital format. And lastly, um, consider the narrative. Can you kind of incorporate the narrative and the world elements into your design without compromising on usability? Consider where the player is and where the UI is located as well. Look for ways in which your UI can enhance the narrative experience both in the game and beyond. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, any questions? <laughs> Do we, do we have time for questions? No, well, I'm going to ask you one question because it's been very outvoted and we have a bunch of questions on accessibility and then we're going to have to go for the break. Uh, so the question is, how did you handle accessibility requirements considering a lot of the UI text is heavily stylized? Did you have consultants or for feedback on those needs? Great, great question. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we, we take accessibility quite seriously in the game and whilst we are... Uh, and an internal agency, we're working as, as, a, as an agency in that capacity uh, with our clients. So it's, we, we try and influence those decisions as much as we can. We work a lot with um, the user testing team and the user research team within Sony to sort of make those decisions. So yeah, it, it's, it's something that we're always trying to do. We weren't great at it 10 years ago, and I think the more and more we're, we're incorporating those decisions, even into our very early mock-ups, so we're, we're going with... Um, very specific uh, font sizes, so we're not too small. So even the early images are accessible. Um, but yeah, uh, they, they were the, the fonts were quite stylized, and we worked with um, our user research team uh, to, to sort of make those decisions. Okay, I was told one more question. Okay, uh, when is the right time in the creative process to make pretty UI, considering game scope changes plus functionality before form? It's a really good question. Um, <laughs> when is the perfect time? Uh, it, and it's something we, we sort of talk about a lot with our clients. It, it's personally from from our experience, I think the sooner you get in and you start fleshing out ideas, um, the better. Uh, not all clients want to work in that way, but we've found much better results and we've actually uh, been able to implement some much more interesting uh, strategies and, and creative solutions when we've been really involved with the project early on. So yeah, as early as possible if, if you can get away with it. Well, thank you so much. We're going to have to stop because we need to go on the break, so don't hesitate to go chat uh, to the speakers uh, yeah. during the break. <laughs> and <laughs> we're all going to be back uh, at 12 p.m. Uh, to start the next talk.